Today's violence is reminiscent of the 1960s and 70s. Now, I've got a very young audience here, so most of you probably don't remember the 60s and 70s. <laughs> I do remember it somewhat. Uh, I do remember some of the riots. Uh, I remember Boston Common and the hippies and the anti-war demonstrations and all that. And I do remember, in fact, I'll never forget, yeah. I was at Franklin Park Zoo when yeah, Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968. Uh, my parents didn't have a car. We were with friends. And our car was stoned. It was kind of interesting. So I, I, am, uh, I do remember, and I also was involved in the forced busing in the 70s in Boston, and I saw a lot of violence uh, you know, happen there. So uh, this is not new to me here. Uh, but today's violence reminiscent of the 60s and 70s. The JBS stopped the movement for a national police force. It set the communist movement back 25 years. How? And let me point out that, yes, we use the word communist because the communists, as well as we call the insiders, work together. George Soros maybe doesn't hold a membership card, but, in, but he backs these far-left organizations. The, the, the funding comes from him. Uh, back in the one of the first things our organization, besides get us, our campaign to get us out of the UN, was a campaign to support your local police. And we had floats and parades, we had billboards around the country. Um, this is a document which a friend of mine, who's not here tonight, offered to put back in print, and we're going to make that available. Uh, uh, this was a, um, a communist plot against the free world press. And these were hearings held by the United States Senate, where people come in and testify and give documentation. It's a few hundred pages. I have it in a PDF format, so if you're really interested, I'd be happy to email it to you. Uh, also, it's available on scribd.com. So, uh, so this is the uh, this is evidence that this was happening. Uh, oh, it, and there are some people. Let me get this down to. Uh, oh, well, I, I have to reformat. Uh, so you can't see the whole thing. But not only are we concerned about a national police, but we're concerned about international controls. Here is. Uh, it should be a nice crop picture, but it's not. But if you go to the Attorney General, the Justice Department's website, right, uh, you will see Loretta Lynch in front of the UN talking about uh, the launch of strong cities. They want a, to have global standards of our police department. Now, uh, this is uh, another picture I had to reformat. 1993, John Burke Society put out a magazine, a special issue, you know, much like the one we showed here. Uh, it's called, it was called our police state issue. And we distributed over a million hard copies. That's before the PDF was invented, right? Uh, we hand delivered them, we mailed them, and we uh, made, it, made them available. It's still, still, it's still available in a PDF format, and you might find some on Amazon here and there. I got a few copies laying around. Inside that issue was a document called Freedom from War, State Department Document 7277. And by the way, if you go online, you can find the whole thing online. It's not something else. Uh, 1961, uh, the Kennedy administration, it was actually John Kennedy, he didn't write it, but he obviously proposed it, went to the United Nations, gave a speech, and he said, uh, he proposed that we take our, have a UN standing army, and we have disarmament to the American people, and the only people that would be armed would be a federal or into, uh, state, uh, federal government police. That's, uh, and that's still the policy of our nation. And I would imagine most people, most gun owners, most gun, Second Amendment gun people probably don't even know this document exists. But that's not because we haven't been trying to tell them over the years. Uh, without this national police force, they could not move the rest of their plans forward since they would not be able to control the American people. They have waited an entire generation to again attempt the national police force. Working quietly behind the scenes, they are now breaking out into the open. This was a couple of photos from uh, Baltimore and Ferguson. Happened within a few months of each other, right? Um, usually when you see a sign that has similar printing and similar websites, you have to look at some kind of planning. They, talk, they think these riots are spontaneous, that these people just decide to let's just get up and start throwing rocks and, and burning things down. Very few riots are spontaneous, folks. They're planned. And uh, Mr. Soros, in fact, in the article in the magazine, how, how the uh, people like Soros fund revolution and create fund groups, and they, they call rent a mobs. You know, they'll, they'll hire people to come in, into their communities and do these things. I remember during the height of forced busing how um, a group called the, um, it was a Marxist group, Progressive Labor Party, actually came into High Park High School, started, burned a flag, that started a riot. 
you see. So I, I, I'm firsthand familiar with these kinds of things. And also uh, how the, on the other side of the spectrum, these, these so-called neo-Nazis all show up in these uniforms right out of central casting and rent a bus. You know, it's almost like, let's just cause trouble. We'll, get, we'll pay for both sides as, you know, against the middle. And it's always the poor, the middle class that suffer, you know, black and white. So uh, anyway, by the way, in Baltimore, Baltimore's police force is about 40 to 50 percent black. The police chief is black. The mayor is black. So what's the problem? Why is this racist? That's a racist incident. And in the magazine, you read some interesting statistics. Uh, roughly about 6,000 blacks are murdered around the country every year. Over 90 percent of those committing the murders are also black. 43% of the people who kill policemen happen to be black, with a population of about 15%. So does that say that all blacks are after cops as much as all cops are after blacks? Of course not. But that's what the, uh, some of these folks want you to believe. Some of these so-called responsible media outlets want you to believe that nonsense, right? Uh, are there cops who are racist? I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are black cops that are racist and there are white cops that are racist. But there's not some kind of racist conspiracy against the average black. Now here is uh, a man, Al Sharpton, we all heard of him. Uh, I think the term reverend should be dropped from his name. There's nothing reverential about this man. He has made a, himself a multimillionaire by promoting race hatred. In fact, I know people in, his, uh, in Brooklyn and, and, and where, uh, in, where he operates, and he lives in New Jersey in an all-white neighborhood, in a nice big fat home, right? He it into the hood, uh, but he doesn't live in the hood. Uh, so, uh, and... You know, the Bible says that there are certain things the Lord finds, the Lord says are an abomination. One of them is uh, uh, causing discord among brothers. Well, folks, I think he's made a living causing discord among brothers. From the Tiana Barali incident, you remember that? It was back in the 80s, or early 90s. He claimed a, a, a young black girl was raped by a bunch of whites when it was a total Tawana fabrication. Brawley. What's that? It was Tawana Brawley. Yes, thank you, yes. Uh, and he doesn't let up. That's what he does for a living. The very fact that he gets on TV, he was on some of these major networks, why? When was the last time you saw someone from the John Bridge Society on the O'Reilly Factor? You're not going to see that, right? And if you did, I guarantee you he'd be hostile. But, oh, with Sharpton, they're all buddies. They're good friends. So they give this guy all the media he wants, right? And many others like him, Jesse Jackson and many others. Uh, they don't give people like uh, Reverend Stevie Kraft equal time. That's our good member from New Jersey, whom most of us know. And other black patriots, uh, no, they don't give them equal time, but they give these folks equal time, more the time than they need. Uh, this is an interesting photo. It's easy to do Photoshop today, but back then it was a little more difficult. This back is from the 60s. There's lots of photos like that. Now, when you first look at it, you see three white guys, all of them are probably racist, members of the local Ku Klux Klan, and they're beating this poor black lady, right, with, with, a, with, a, with, a, uh, with, a, with a club, right? And that's, that's what you'd probably get the headlines of the local newspaper, right? But if you look at it a little closer, you'll see what really happened. You see how this policeman, he, where he's holding the club? The lady had grabbed the club from one of the policemen, and she was using it against him. And the other police just came to back up, and, and so you see them trying to take the club away from her. So it's, uh, it's interesting how you can put a spin on something, a power of suggestion. Back in the 90s, remember Bosnia? To justify our invasion of Bo or our attack of, on Bosnia, our bombing of Bosnia, because there was genocide going on, right? No, okay, genocide's not a good thing. Of course, when it happens in China and happens in Ethiopia and other parts of the world, we don't seem to care too much, but it happens in Bosnia, and the UN wants to come in and, and, and cause some trouble. There was a picture of, a very famous picture of a man, uh, he, was, he was without a shirt, and he looked emaciated. He looked like his ribs, you could see his ribs. He looked pretty sickly. He looked like this poor guy is starving. This looks like some prison camp from World War II. Uh, 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 and actually, the poor guy had just had some kind of ailment. He was on the other side of this camp, looking in. But the picture you saw is an emaciated guy. We've got to do something. We've got to take action. So this happens all the time. Um, there's no need for federal oversight because all local, most towns and cities and what have counties have lots of internal oversight, internal affairs. You ask any policeman on the force of a big size city what they think of internal affairs when they get a call. They don't like them, you know, because they're pretty tough, right? Chief of police, the mayor, the city council, the city attorney, county attorney, county commissioners, state attorney general, governor, legislator, in the ballot box. 
Now, uh, in, during the height of forced busing, uh, when I, I was going to school, I was late for class. And I thought, you know, I'd just make sure I would scoot to the class. Uh, and rocking down the hallway was the headmaster, Mr. Donato, whose son played for the Boston Bruins, Teddy Donato. Some of you who follow hockey might know that. And with him was a federal marshal. The guy was about six foot 20. I mean, a huge guy. Show was like this. He looked like he played for the Patriots. And he, he slammed me against the wall lock. Just, I mean, I was not going, I was just going to class, but I was the only one in the hallway, wham, slammed against the wall locker. Well, I thought that was not the right thing to do, uh, but I was not stupid enough to attack him. I thought I'd just simply cut out and I would call police. Cut out means you leave the class, you leave the school, you see. So I did that. I found a pay phone. In those days, there were still pay phones around. And I called 911 and I said, I, I want to report an assault and battery. And I explained to the dispatcher that it was a federal marshal in Hyde Park High School in Metropolitan Avenue in Hyde Park. And the dispatcher laughed and said, federal marshal, they're above the law. No, no accountability. Mm -hmm. Just like the Ruby Ridge incident, you remember that? Yeah. Where a FBI sharpshooter, and these guys know exactly, they were one of the, some of the most highly trained sharpshooters, shot a woman holding a baby. No accident. You saw the take the shot, and he did. Didn't kill the baby, killed the wife, killed the mother. And also down in Waco, where they incinerated some children, along with many others. And, and Hollywood was happy to tell us what a horrible group of people these folks were. They've been, and, and this group's been around since the 30s, and very few incidents. But no, no matter, that's federal police. Was there any accountability? Yeah. Uh, the husband of the woman who was shot uh, got a couple million dollars about five or six years later. Never got his wife back. Uh, in Boston, there was a group called the Tactical Police Force, TPF, and they were a little bit, somewhat known as rogue, and one time they went into a bar room where some of the anti-busser types were con congregating, and um, I almost said conjugate, that's what uh, Mayor Menino said about homeless people uh, in Boston. Uh, anyway, I digress. Uh, and they just beat everybody up in the, in, in the bar room, uh, and, uh, but there was accountability. They were uh, dismissed. Uh, the ent entity was put out of business, and those officers were, were reprimanded, and some of them were jailed, or they lost their job, or whatever. I don't remember all the details. But there was accountability. So you still have some at the state local level, but very little at the federal level. Police corruption. If the local police are corrupt, it is localized, not national. If they are corrupt, it can be changed by the people. If a national police are corrupt, it is all over the country, and unlikely to be changed without any major social and political upheaval. And sometimes you get a bad federal cop in Windham, yeah, guess what happens? He goes over to Ohio or maybe California. They shift him around, and you get the bad cop from Los Angeles in your little town here. That's how they do it. Um, so uh, also, you're under the, dis, uh, the uh, jurisdiction of the Justice Department, not Congress. Congress has uh, maybe had a little oversight when it comes to uh, funding, but that the Justice Department, or should I say the Injustice Department, there is a plan. The insiders, these are the folks we talk about here in, in the shadows of power, uh, want a national police to control the American people. Oh, by the way, I mentioned the Al Sharpton shoot there I met a minute ago. Yeah, Al Sharpton wants to end localized police, demand nationalized police force. That, I meant to, meant to point that out. I didn't do that, so sorry. So, um, uh, th this was um, a speech before the foreign. Policy Association of Pennsylvania by Congressman Joseph Clark Baldwin, February 13, 1943, in support of the Atlantic Charter. He went on to support the downsizing of U.S. armed forces before the formation of an international police force. Uh, so local police forces obviously would be reduced as state and national police protection is increased. So this is a long time plan. This plan did just come around a few, uh, a few years ago. Now militia. Now when a lot of people, when they hear the word militia, they think of a bunch of fat, middle-aged middle white guys with AR-15s running around the woods. That is not a militia. Okay, the militia under the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the States is, uh, what's the Second Amendment say? A well-regulated militia being necessary for the defense of a free state. That's not been repealed. How can we kind of forget that? Is it still necessary? What happened was in 1903, they did away with what is, they redefined the militia. Could you imagine, the, uh, they have this term, the unorganized militia. Well, what good is an unorganized militia? It's really no militia. The definition of militia is organized and well-regulated. Well doesn't just mean there's a lot of rules, but also that these folks know they're trained. 
They're trained in certain things. They're trained in crowd control. They're trained in flood control, emergencies, snowstorms, and all kinds of things. We have no militia. We have a National Guard. You know, the militia it comprised of lots of people. And I remember we had to do was a reenactment uh, at one of the uh, National Center for Constitutional Studies. And uh, James Madison, Dan Ness is dressed up as James Madison. And he's told that the militia, the National Guard of New Hampshire is like 5,000 people. And he said, he's in modern day, he said, what happened to the population of your state? I must have doodled down to nothing because you only have 5,000 militiamen. Uh, you know, uh, that's unheard of, right? So there would be a whole lot of militia. And I guarantee you, things like the bombing in Boston, the marathon bombing, you wouldn't need these guys in uh, automatic weapons and these half-tracks locking down a city. These people would probably have known these guys because they would have been their neighbors, you see. And it would probably would have taken just a short time to, come to, to apprehend these folks. So, so there is no constitutional prerogative for police to be controlled by the federal government. Ninth and Tenth Amendments of the Constitution. The Constitution does not mention police power because police did not exist at that time. Local authority was through the sheriff and the militia. The sheriff is the legally constituted and elected authority in a county. Now, you remember that lady in Kentucky that refused to issue a, um, a marriage license and a federal judge had her arrested and put in a county jail? Well, the county sheriff should have said to the federal judge, we're going to arrest you if you come into this county, and you're not going to use our jails to put a woman who's simply upholding our state law. That's how this would have been handled if we had the right system. And we have people with some guts, right? Can you imagine a federal judge in a county prison? Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be beautiful? What a thing of beauty that would be, huh? You arrogant uh, uh, black robed scoundrel. How dare you say that a Supreme Court decision will overturn our law? You know, a decision based on one case has nothing to do with Kentucky, right? Uh, the militia is the state's prerogative for unrest and the federal prerogative for invasion and rebellion. But you see, militia's duty was in, within the United States. It wasn't to be sent abroad. And the, 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 the CFR folks, the people actually, even before this was founded, uh, trying to get us to become an empire during the, uh, I'm digressing a little bit, but the, uh, the Spanish-American War, the militia wasn't allowed to go to Cuba and the Philippines, so they had to change things a little bit. Today, the National Guard are sent all over the world, right, in these various missions. So, anyway, that's just, that's, now, J. Edgar Hoover, whether you like J. Edgar Hoover or not, isn't so much the issue. Uh, his FBI would not be taking shots at women holding babies, I guarantee you. His FBI would not be going to Moscow, as uh, Clinton's FBI did under Louis Free, and meeting with his cohort, uh, his uh, KGB cohort, and saying together that together we are both entities, we are invincible. That was never the purpose of the FBI. Okay? FBI's mission was strictly in the United States. America has no place for it, nor does it need a national police force. It should be abundantly clear by now that effective law enforcement is basically a local responsibility. In the great area arena of self-government reserved for states, counties, and cities, the enforcement of the laws is not only their duty, but also their right. Law-abiding citizens and local officials should vigorously oppose concerted attacks against law enforcement and the devious moves to negate local authority and replace it with federal power. He said that in 1968. So, the destruction of federalism. A national police force would be controlled by the executive branch, completely destroying the federal balance of power between the three branches of government, the states, and local government. The call is not for Congress, but for the Department of Justice, the executive branch, to have oversight. Just like the, the gun running they did in Mexico, oh, they, really, they really got the bottom. How about all the illegal aliens, the laws that they refuse to enforce? How selective they are enforcing certain laws, aren't they? Right? Um, <clears throat> Once, uh, the once enough cities led by liberal leftist leaders acquiesce to federal oversight, the pressure for all cities to do so will be intense and it will be bypassed Congress. In fact, the Obama administration has already have a pilot project. I think eight cities have signed up for this to go under federal guidelines. I think Cleveland, Ohio was one of them. There was one of those cities in, yeah, I think it was Houston or somewhere in Texas. But nothing in the Northeast to my knowledge. Uh, but this is not new. Uh, here in Concord, didn't they have a, what, what, isn't the federal government trying to give Concord a, uh, an armored vehicle? Did, it, did, that, did that actually happen? I don't know yeah. if they actually yeah. took it. Yeah. They took it, right? Yeah. A handful of them, right? Yeah, and, and the majority of the crowd 
Yeah, I'll it was against it. it. It was against it, yeah. And the police chief made the uh, decision. The police chief took this stuff, right? Yeah. And with that comes control. Also, there's a lot of money locally because it costs a lot of money to keep maintain those things. They may never use them. Let's hope they don't. But you got to keep them going. You got to maintain them. So, uh, so uh, like, um, well, I'll get into Sheriff Sheriff Frank in a few minutes here. Uh, all in the name of police, police brutality. So it was in the 1960s, and so it is today. The controlled media always attacks the police, not the rioters and communist cadre. You didn't hear anything about George Soros funding these groups like Black Lives Matters, did you? When you put on your uh, the news story, anything about that? They don't tell you that the standard of living in these cities is pretty good, pretty one of the best in the world. You know, they don't tell you those kinds of things when you watch. You just see, you know, somebody uh, the, the policeman who. Uh, was uh, what shot the man in uh, Ferguson? He was exonerated. He was justified in doing that, right? And they don't show you that this guy wasn't exactly a quiet boy. He had a pretty nasty streak and nasty record. Um, uh, pe so people claim they do not believe the media, then believe the change in charges of police brutality they read and see in the media. What people see is the reaction by police, not the provocation. And I also want to mention too, uh, our job is not only to stop the federalization of the police, but it's also to help policemen become constitutional. So let me give you an example. Uh, back in the mid-90s, we would have an information table at the Tunbridge Fair in Vermont, which is in Orange County, not too far from uh, White River Junction, maybe 30 miles north. And one of the, uh, the Brady Law had just passed, and there was about a dozen or so sheriffs, only a dozen of all the sheriffs around the country, only a dozen had the guts to say no to this thing. So we had a feature story in the New American Magazine. And behind, in front of the table, our table, was this gentleman. He was in a jumpsuit with a badge. I thought he was just uh, fair security. I had no idea who he was at the time. And he's reading the article earlier intently, you know. And I said, oh, by the way, there's a sheriff here in Vermont. That's one of the sheriffs that's bucking the Brady Law. He said, yeah, I'm that sheriff. <laughs> the sheriff, Sam Frank. And I got to know Sam. He's now, I think, now in Virginia. But he, I, I got to, and Sam was an elected official. I got to know him pretty well, and he told me initially the Second Amendment of the Constitution was not his motivation to oppose the Brady Law. He said what happened was Congress passes a law, now we have to enforce it here, and we have to pay for its, for its, uh, its implement, implement, implementation. And he said we couldn't afford it, we're a poor county. And along the way, though, he met Sheriff uh, Richard Mack in Arizona, and <coughs> others, folks like people in the John Birch Society. So he, be, he became a constitutionalist. And he'd come by our table, we'd have a 10 question quiz on the Constitution. And we would give constitutions away to people who would take the quiz as an incentive to come to the table. So he would always ask for copies of the quiz and as many constitutions as we could spare. He says, because my deputies will be constitutional, so they won't serve under me. So, <laughs> so that's our, our job, is to make policemen. I mean, if the policemen are trained that everyone who uh, has an NRA decal or anyone who has a get us out of the UN bumper sticker is the bad guy, well, that's what they're going to think, you see. Um, so sometimes it's just the poor training they get. And one of the things you'll notice if you visit police stations, talk about a, a similar design, most police stations have bulletproof glass. You go into the police station and there's a bullet, it's like a bank. Why is that? A little town or a big city? Same design. I was in Madawaska. There's one exception, a recent exception. Madawaska, way up on the Canadian border, right? They don't have that in Madawaska. <laughs> uh, but most most police departments. You go here, I'm sure, in uh, in Windham. I stopped in the. Uh, I stopped in a few police departments today, and they all had them. It's almost like this psychological barrier, you know. Good guys in here, bad guys out there. You see, so. Uh, and they're getting, no doubt, federal and state money to, to implement, to build these things, right? So here, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Lord Acton. <clears throat> Two-prone initiative. Educate opinion molders on the dangers of a national police. Now, who are, who are opinion molders? Anybody, anybody have an idea? Mm -hmm. uh, who's an opinion molder? Mayor, well, select Everybody in this room, yeah. Yeah. if you're an a freedom activist, you are an opinion molder, to begin with, right? I know Gene, all the stuff you do, you are one serious opinion molder, all the stuff you do, right? Ed Sargent, all the, when Ed Sargent used to drive his 18-wheeler, he carried a case of book, various books. He was an opinion molder, right? <clears throat> but we think of opinion molders as maybe a local talk show host, uh, maybe a school teacher or a principal, uh, a state rep, a selectman, a mayor, 
a police chief, uh, the local reporter from the uh, daily paper or the weekly paper, or the owner of the local paper, who's a little more accessible maybe the, than the big city daily. You know? So these are just examples of opinion molders. Educate the police on the dangers of going to the federal government for solutions to local problems. Now you see this reprint of this article, uh, actually it was two articles from the New American Magazine. Uh, we mailed out, it was a our headquarters did this in Appleton, Wisconsin. We mailed out copies of this, I think it was about 12 pages, I may have a few on the table here, uh, to every single police department in the country. That includes, if it's like the city of Boston has a lot of uh, districts, you know, so it went to all the departments in the whole city, New York City, all the big cities, as well as every little town. Um, also, we sent them out to sheriffs and state policemen in all 50 states. And one of the articles in there deal, dealt with the Southern Poverty Law Center, you can see that, SPLC. That's one of the bad organizations, in our opinion. That's not so poor. They're worth millions and millions of dollars. And they have got a lot of influence, or had a lot of influence, in local police. And they get their reports all the time. They're mailed to them all the time. And who are the bad guys? Who are the uh, local terrorists? Not anybody from ISIS. It's guys like Bill McNally who put these horrible things like on, on YouTube, you know. It's guys who passed our constitutions. It's veterans coming back from the Gulf. Those are the potential terrorists. You know, now some policemen instinctively know this is nonsense. Let some buy into this. Especially the big cities, big liberal cities. Um, thankfully, I think the FBI recently said, we don't need your stuff anymore. The Obama FBI, that's, that's saying something, that's good. So the difference is between, they have tons of money, but they don't have a lot of feet on the ground, boots on the ground. They don't have local members that reach out to their policemen. And most of these, these people despise the local police. You know, uh, they're not our friends, our neighbors. You know, it was very interesting. Uh, I was in Ohio uh, on a farm shooting. Uh, I used to cover Ohio. And a state cop comes by. We're in a big farm. We're just shooting all M1s and all kinds of great <laughs> things. A policeman, a state patrolman shows up. And you think, oh, my goodness. He said, hey, Lester, you, how long are you boys going to be shooting? I get out of work in an hour. I'm coming and join you if you guys look around. <laughs> That's the way it should be. Yeah. That's the way it should be. You should, oh, my, the cops are here. I better make sure I get my permit or I better hide things. No. Come on, let us shoot. We have a member up in Etna, New Hampshire. He's a southern boy. And he's got a pretty good little, uh, little range on his property. He has policemen come on his property to shoot stuff they can't shoot at the gun range. He's got a good, he's talking about SWAT, your local police. They love this guy, right? Uh, you think the Southern Poverty Law Center will do that with your local cop? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, so we need your help. Can you help form and lead a local support to local police committee? Right? Can you help gift us as necessary funds we need to implement a successful, robust campaign? We're doing a lot on, uh, on Facebook. Um, the Boston Patrolmen's Association, which was founded by my former landlord, the late Warren Bradley. It's good when you go into these places and have you can name drop and, and then you pick up their 50, 50th anniversary magazine and there's my, my late uh, landlord right there as a co-founder. They're going to be running ads in their magazine, which goes all over the country. We've already contracted. We've already talked to them about it. And um, what's the name of the magazine? The Pax Centurion, and uh, it's about. It's not a big circulation. About five thousand. I shouldn't say every single police department, but a lot of them around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you remember the uh, when Obama came to Boston this past Labor Day, and he was speaking at some function, the patrolmen turned their backs on him. Oh yeah, they're not too happy with Obama. And so we have some, we have some really good allies uh, in, at, that, at that organization. Uh, there's also a lot of benevolent police organizations. I stopped off at the, not only the National Police, but the, the National PAL, Police Athletic League, and they were very receptive. Um, there's a group in Massachusetts called uh, Law Enforcement Support, and these are made up of family members, mostly wives of policemen, wives and uh, you know, children of policemen. So there's lots of these kinds of people uh, that we need to uh, influence. So we're asking for your help that way as well. This is what we need. We need some new tools. I showed you some of them. We're in the process of producing some videos, not just for YouTube and social media, but also in DVD format. Reprints and pamphlets. And we can, we can produce all the pamphlets. We can have mountains of these things, but we also need to get them out in the hands of people as well. And that's why we have secret weapons like Gene, who passes things out all the time, right? Um, we need to have a so social media initiative. In fact, I just go on your Facebook. When I was uh, doing this event in uh, Attleboro, 
Uh, I went Attleboro Police, and there's a Facebook page for Attleboro Police. I posted the flyer that's in a JPEG format, and then something else popped up, and it's three other benevolent groups. So you find these people. You don't even know they exist, and you can find them just on Facebook. And you can download some of these photos we have and just paste them. And if we have an event like this, just uh, list the, post the event on their Facebook page, right? Uh, national law enforcement mailings and contacts, uh, national coordination to help local committees organize and strategize speakers. Uh, the best speaker is either an active duty policeman or a retired policeman. My boss, Jim Fitzgerald, is a retired Newark, Newark, uh, New Jersey detective. So uh, I think the fact that he had had a badge at one time uh, carries a little more weight than what most. And we have to coordinate with other organizations. One of them is Oath Keepers. Some people are familiar with that group. Yep. Part of their membership base are first responders. When you call 911, for, you know, whether it be medics, firemen, policemen. And those are the people. So I spoke to their group uh, down in Rhode Island, very well received, and they're very excited about the campaign. Um, if we don't do it, who will? What no other groups stepping up? You know, and if you, if you believe it's needed, then you know, you know get involved and help out. Uh, and what I want to also suggest is to become a JBS member. If you're not a member, formally join our organization.